Hello, and welcome to the Inside EVs podcast for August 14th, 2020. This is episode number 19. Today, we'll be talking about the Lucid Air achieving 517 miles of range, Ionic becomes a new EV sub-brand for Hyundai, the Cadillac Lyric price tag is less than $60,000. I'm Dominic Yoni, Inside EVs editor and Inside EVs forum moderator. Joining us today, we have Tom Malogny, multiple EV owner and Inside EVs editor. We also have Martin Lee from the EV News Daily podcast, available on all your usual podcast platforms. And of course, we have Kyle Connor from the Out of Spec Motoring and One Lap YouTube channels. He also puts together the super awesome videos for the new Inside EVs YouTube channel. Go subscribe and that, tap that bell icon for notifications. So welcome, gentlemen of the panel and ladies and gentlemen of the audience. Uh, see, our first big story today is about Lucid Motors. Uh, it's luxury sedan called Air achieved a 517 uh, miles of range in a third-party test using uh, EPA protocols. Uh, that is more range than anything available in the market right now, although the, uh, the coming Tesla Roadster is supposed to get like 620 miles. Uh, there's been a few different responses to this result. Some are discounting it because it has a, a bigger battery than the Tesla Model S, which is rated for 402 miles, and it's kind of the, the standing champion, and, and maybe has similar efficiency. Uh, personally, uh, I say let Lucid have their moment. It's a great range figure, and you know they got it honestly as far as we know. Uh, Tesla could also come out with a Model S Plaid or, or something in a month or so, which could have even more range, and that's also fine. But even if they do, you know, 517 miles is it's a great number, and you know if it's 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 okay if eventually it's not like the, the top range either. But yeah, so uh, how do you feel about this, uh, Kyle? Yeah, well, uh, it's something we've known for a while that Lucid is one to take seriously. And I think a lot of these Twitter folks are getting confused. Uh, however, they really did this with a prototype vehicle under EPA testing standards. And I think, you know, we've seen some real world tests as well with Motor Trend and others achieving well into the mid 400 range on highway cruising. So that's super impressive. Um, look, I, I think, um, you know, no, no, no problem here. I just think it's too much range. I mean, how, how far can you really go on one tank of, uh, without having to go to the bathroom? So I think this is the right number. What, what it really means to me, this range is I can now drive quickly from charger to charger and really never have to worry about making it. Also, you know, we'll have to see what their fast charging curve is, but right. if it can do this 350 kilowatt that they're talking about and it can do it deep into the pack, it's just gonna be the ultimate road tripper because that figure, again, you're not gonna get that 500 miles ripping down the highway. You'll get 300 miles or maybe 280 after a charge, but that's still plenty of mileage at high speed. So I'm, I'm a big fan. I uh, can't wait to take one across the country as soon as possible and uh, see what it can do. So so as you're saying there, the, um, Motor Trend and Bloomberg both got a, a ride, around, ride along range test uh, with Lucid and they had a, like a Model S, uh, Model S long range and the uh, Porsche Taycan uh, Turbo S along with them to see, you know, which one, see how far they could get each one to go in like real world driving. And uh, so the, the Porsche Taycan, it, it did better than its EPA range of uh, 192 miles. It, it got 236 miles before it dropped out. Uh, the Tesla Model S, which is rated at 402 miles, it went 355 miles. And then the Lucid Air, which we were just saying, it got a 517 mile result. Uh, it went 456 miles. So it's still like an extra, another another 100 miles farther than the uh, Tesla Model S. So that's, that's pretty impressive in, in real world. But uh, you're pretty familiar with this result, right, Tom? Yeah, definitely. You know, it's from what uh, the the Lucid Air and the Tesla Model S did is what I would expect. They both did around 10% less than what their EPA rating is. Or well, in the Lucid cases, what Lucid is claiming that it was EPA. They did the, the independently verified EPA range test, and it came up with 517 miles. Um, so the Tesla and Lucid both came in at about 10% less than what their EPA range rating is, what you would expect for a highway range test. 
Now, the Taycan, on the other hand, did 20% better than their yeah. EPA range test. And this is something that Kyle and I and others at Info Inside EVs and even other journalists who've driven the Taycan. I mean, I've driven over a thousand mile in, 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 in uh, Taycans by now. And I've consistently said that uh, on normal highway driving, the Taycan crushes its EPA range rating, which is super unusual. The only other car that we've ever tested at, at a highway speed that did better than its EPA range rating was the Hyundai Ionic, and it beat it by one mile. You know, the, 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 the Taycons that I've driven easily can do 20, 30, 40 miles better than their EPA range rating at highway speed. So, you know, there's there just something about the Taycan and how it performs under the EPA range certification that doesn't really tell the whole story. Maybe it's the two-speed gearbox and that at, at highway speeds, it's more efficient. Um, I, I, I don't have a clear answer to that, but uh, it definitely will outperform its EPA range rating on the highway, whereas just about every other electric vehicle will do slightly less than its EPA range rating on the highway. So, uh, yeah, um, as far as the, the, the range of, of, of the air, as, as Kyle mentioned before, Kyle said something, it's too much. And um, I've long been saying that at, at some point, what we're going to see now is there's going to be range wars. Everyone's going to try to get more and more and more range. But then at some point, that's going to level off. And then the ranges are going to reduce. And it really depends on how mature our, our DC fast charge infrastructure is. Once it's as easy to fill up as, uh, you know, recharge your car as it is to get gas, where there, there's DC fast chargers everywhere, it still might take slightly longer. It's, it, I don't know if it's going to be a two or three minute stop. But let's say it's a 10 or 12 minute stop. Once these DC fast chargers are everywhere, what I think we're going to start seeing is people are going to be more comfortable with range and electric vehicles and automakers are going to start reducing the size of the battery. And that's going to do a bunch of things. It's going to lower the cost of the vehicles. It's going to make the vehicles lighter and more efficient. And it's really, you know, it's going to be the point where you just see adoption just take off that hockey stick curve is just going to take off when we get to that point. I think we're going to get there in about five or six years. I think somewhere after the the, the middle of, of this decade, uh, I, I think we're going to start to see that where people get it, infrastructures mature, and ma manufacturers start making their batteries smaller, lighter, and, and less expensive. It's going to dramatically drop down the cost of the vehicle. Imagine if Tesla only had to put a 50 or 60 kilowatt hour battery in their cars because there's superchargers and charging stations everywhere, uh, how much less and more affordable these cars would be. So um, while I agree with Kyle with, the, you know, it's too much, it might not be too much for right now, uh, but it, it, it there will come a time soon where I don't think auto manufacturers are really going to be concerned with 500 mile battery ranges. So Martin, you do have a, a Zoe, a Renault Zoe, and you get about 200 miles of range? Yeah, it's a really small city car. It's got a 42 kilowatt hour battery. It's the second version of that. There's a third version now on sale, uh, which is the 50 kilowatt hour battery. So I've got, I've got, my car is a year old now, and only 200 miles. You know what? I can't remember the last time we charged it, partly because we're still right. in semi lockdown here, partly because uh, I've now moved to working from nearly in nearly always this space. Okay. So I'm not driving very much. And, you know, where's my wife going to take the little baby boy to the, you know, go see the relatives, do the shops, do our chores. We charge probably once right. a week on that car because we just don't do a lot of miles. And it's one of those, you know, it's one of those things that it's a behavior. That, you know, when it's funny when you know Tom says over the next five or six years, and I think it's going to feel like five or six minutes because things are moving so quickly. I can't believe we're you know we've done nineteen of these weekly shows, and and I, I feel like we've been talking forever about these things because if you look back at show one, I'm sure there's things that have moved on since then. Sure, yeah, you know, this it's like a hundred years of combustion engines are being compressed into this crazy time with EVs that we're living through. Like this year and next year are just going to be these crazy times where. You know, I do agree there's going to be some 
you know, Willie waving in the gym changing room where, you know, I've got the biggest range. So I think, and, and I think Elon is probably pretty guilty. I think him and his ego are going to be pretty guilty of wanting Nürburgring fastest, most range. He, what, he, no, he'll call it the halo car. Like he's, he's saying, oh, I just want it to be all combustion cars. But I get the feeling he hates, I get the feeling he hates to be beaten. Um, he hates but there's going to be, you know, and, and that's fine. That's a, that's a billionaire's prerogative. But sure. uh, that is at some point, going to be beaten by a car that is either going to be quicker or faster or just better. Look, it, it, like Teslas already are beaten in so many ways that just never get talked about. Like, go and sit in a Taycan, uh, go and sit in an e-tron, go and sit in a EQC. I mean, they're just put together so well. So, right. it, it, we, we, are, we are exiting this compressed stage where there is an, a perception that one car has to be the best at everything. Right. To no, a more yeah. like where, where combustion cars have got to because they've had like a hundred years to get there. So some cars are the cheapest and some are the most luxurious and some are the, the quickest not to sixty, but they can't go around like you you know, you can't take a drag car around the Nürburgring. So we are moving to that at, at just a record pace. And it's gonna be a I don't even I don't know how long it's gonna be until someone comes out and says, I don't want that much range. So right. it's weight. Well, it's four things, isn't it? It's it's weight versus cost of the car versus where you can charge and, and, and how quickly you can charge as well. So and, those things, and they're all moving targets. And no one knows where it's, anyone that says they know where it's going to end up, well, no one knows. Like, what, uh, is, what is the optimum battery size versus charging? Like, one of the reasons I love 517 miles is because I haven't got to stop, right? So if I'm on a long road trip and there's so few fast charges around, I, I can do that and I can pull in and I don't, whereas at the minute, I think most EV drivers would say, if you see a spare charger, you're plugging in because you don't, you know, you just want to get some, some juice. So, right. uh, you oh. know, it's, it's so nuanced. I mean, it, it, and it's exciting, right? I'm so, so excited about this car. Just, it just, it just exploded the news this week. It was so cool. It's a, it was a luxury car and I'm, I'm thinking like 570 miles. It's like a, a luxury item at this point. You know, so you, like you're saying, you don't have to take the, uh, you don't have to stop for, for charging, you know, for charging like nearly as much as you might uh, might happen when you do. The pack's so big that you can charge at speed. Is it really 350 kilowatts? Is that their charging it's, speed? It's it's a 900 volt plus system. Right. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. it can use 350 kilowatt charges. Yeah. Well, that'd be great. So then it would yeah. be. Yeah, we haven't seen their DC charging curve right. yet, but. I would imagine they would get it close to 350 right. kilowatt, at least high. Yeah, I mean, it, has to be. it has to be. I mean, the Taycan is still pegged at what, 270, 280, and they reckon that's going to be. Yeah, that's right. I, think, uh, I, I think Lucid has a unique kind of uh, battery cell cooling method. I think they're using the immersion. I'm not really positive about that, but they do the Formula E packs as well. And um, I'm pretty sure it's like an immersion cell, so I think they can cool them very, very quickly. So I think their curve is going to be impressive. Or I'm, you know, I, I kind of, I'm hoping because when you're like a startup like this, you need every technological edge you can get. You know, to really sell yourself. And you know, why would somebody buy a, a Lucid over, you know, a, a Tesla? Because maybe it has like, you know, a little bit better luxury or more range or a com combination of factors. September 9th, isn't it? We find out more. September 9th of September, we find out. I think out you're more. gonna. Yes. Yes. 9th of September. And I think, you know, Tom, you've been there. I've spent some time with the Lucid team too. It's very apparent that every single ounce of efficiency of a quality product is being chased like nonstop. It is their total goal. And people always forget that like the man who engineered or basically led the team for the Model S runs right. Lucid, right? So it's not just like a total startup with wing ding people around that have no idea what they're doing. It is a hundred percent the ex Tesla team that's working on this car, and basically it's what everyone at Tesla probably wanted to do. And now they're saying, "Go build something. Don't worry about the cost as much. Build something amazing, and then I think they'll figure out how to rein it in and and right. have the finance department get involved later." But engineering right. first. And we should point out as well, yeah. like the the price starts at less than sixty. And not that we know, we'll find out on the ninth. But no, that's something um, else. Oh, that's something else. Okay, yeah, I thought they were going to make a like a low range version. Uh, uh, of, the, and, and it's like once again we're getting like confused with uh, price and range. So 
to, to get this top 517 mile version, it's going to be way more than 100k. So yeah, they might make a cheaper version of it, but it's not going to have that battery pack in. So I like just be careful of the headlines that I've sort of seen around in places this week. They might well make a cheaper one at some point after. Um, and we're going to talk about what else they'll go into as well. But no doubt that's going to have a much smaller a much smaller range. But actually, that would be fine if it had like 350 and you get to save a few, a few dollars. That's fine. Absolutely. Um, yeah. and one, of, one of the things that Kyle mentioned that we kind of glossed over, which we shouldn't have, was the efficiency about how, um, you know, anybody could make an EV with a 500 mile range <laughs> if they just put a gigantic battery pack in it. Now, you know, obviously the bigger the pack is, the less efficient the vehicle. It's almost you're chasing that goal. You have to keep mm. adding more batteries to offset the weight of the batteries you just added. So the cars get less and less efficient the bigger and heavier the battery pack is. But it doesn't seem like that's the case with the Lucid Air because, you know, Lucid has told us that the battery pack is smaller than 130 kilowatt hours. Okay, so then that you know that means it's like 128 or 129 if they said it's smaller than 130. So just the fact if you do the math and assume that it's right up to 130, it you know the, the Tesla's battery pack is is 100 kilowatt hours, so it's about 30 percent larger than the what Tesla uses for the Model S and Model X, and the range is about 30 percent more than what Tesla gets for the Model S. So if that all holds true, they actually did do better than Tesla efficiently, because, efficiency wise, because they maintain the same efficiency with a much heavier battery pack, which is harder to do. So if, if this all pans out, as, as it's been explained to us, that it gets a, a 500 mile plus EPA range rating and, he, and they do it with under 130 kilowatt hours uh, of energy, that's fantastic. We, we just took it yeah. a, a, another step forward in efficiency with electric vehicles. And they're using cylindrical cells as well. So again, another parallel to where those people came from. Like no one else has made a new EV with 2170 form factor cells. They're using them from LG Chem and yet they've gone down that road. So for whatever wh whatever reason, they again, drawing those lines between where those, those, those people started, not started their careers, but probably made a name for themselves, a Tesla, uh, again, there must be something about what they're doing with that pack to make it super efficient in terms of the cooling. Right. So speaking of Lucid, uh, their CEO, Peter Rawlinson, also let slip that the company is, uh, they have a running SUV prototype. Tom, I understand you have the scoop on that. Yeah, this was really interesting. It, it was no complete, it wasn't a complete secret that Lucid was working on an SUV. That's been out there for a while that that was going to be their next vehicle. But you hear that all the time with startups that they're not, oh, we're not just doing this. We're going to do this and this and this. And, you you know, until you see something, you really just kind of say, oh, yeah, that's just, you know, marketing speak. Uh, but this week, uh, the the YouTube channel e for electric where I'm, I'm a weekly guest on, um, had an interview with Peter Rawlinson, the CEO, and he kind of let it slip at that, oh yeah, we have a working prototype. And I know a, a lot of people might just assume that, oh, he was planning on saying that all the time. I don't think that's the case because uh, there was some back and forth, back and forth talk between the YouTube channel and Lucid on whether this was going to be, you know, aired or how they were going to present it. So, you know, I really truly believe Rawlinson didn't mean to say that, but it was recorded and he said it. So they, uh, E for Electric had the exclusive uh, talk on this. Uh, so, yeah, it, they have a fully functioning, uh, well, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say fully functioning. They have a functioning, drivable SUV that's based on the Air's platform. Right. And when uh, Guberman of E for Electric asked them, well, that's fantastic. When are we going to see it? You know, he's Rawlinson's response was, well, you know, just keep an eye on that that nine nine space, which is when we're going to have the reveal of the air. So it looks like we're getting a two for one. And, uh, you know, we're going to get to see the, uh, the their concept SUV on September 9th. So like this is turned into a must see event. As far as I'm concerned, if you're an electric vehicle enthusiast, we kind of know what the air is going to look like. So. Right. You know, it wasn't 
a must see on that alone. They've already tweeted pictures of it. We, we, we know what it looks like. Um, I mean, I still would have tuned in for, for this, but you know, maybe everybody wouldn't have, but now I'm recommending, you know, if you, if you're interested in electric vehicles, tune into this on September 9th, because I think it's going to be a really good event. So you think the SUV is going to be like the Apple and here's another thing situation. Yes. Yeah, it might be. Yeah, it might, it might well be. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just so pleased they've got more in their locker because right. that to me says that roadmap is robust and they're going to be here in 10 years time. I, I think on, so I, I think on the show, he mentioned that they have like a, a number of different vehicles and yeah. he said platforms. So he mm -hmm. has like a, at least one other platform in mind. I don't know. I imagine yeah, it's going to be smaller. Yeah. Me mentioned the, that the that the pickup wouldn't be on this platform. That the pickup would need a bigger platform. Right. If they do a pickup. Um, if yeah. they do a pickup. Right. But but they said that they that they have built out for bigger vehicles. So he talked about the paint uh -huh. shop, for instance, and said actually right, right. we've built that's the right. paint shop knowing that we're going to make bigger vehicles one day because that, apparently that's a big issue in making cars is the size of paint shops and and so when they make those kind of points, you've got to. You know, read beneath what they're saying, and it just it, their their roadmap just m must look very robust. And I'm I'm really pleased about that because I really really want Lucid to succeed. Well, they were they were planning on finishing their their factory really soon. I think originally they were like they wanted to go from dirt to cars rolling out in eight months, which is like really crazy. That's you know, quicker than I think Tesla did in Shanghai, which was yeah. also already crazy. Yeah, they had but to the, wait a little while to get the money in the door and the funding and, and things right. were on pause for a while, but they just seem full steam ahead right now. Right. So I'm just wondering about the timing now of the SUV, of like the the, the cars coming that's going to be revealed. And they, I think it's like next summer, is it uh, mid-2021, uh, Tom? I think that's when they're the plan right now. Yeah, it was going to be earlier, but with COVID, it got pushed back a few months. Sure. I, think, I think they're talking June-ish of 2021 for, uh, you know, customer deliveries so what i understood from the video is that like if when they do the s to do the suv they need to build on to the factory they need to expand what you know the original footprint of that to you know, accommodate a, a second line for suvs so it might not they might show it on the ninth but it's going to be a, a little while after that after the uh, the air you know hits the streets makes the first deliveries before the suv can make that same thing be interesting to see how how long down, how far down the road that comes. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that this isn't something, this isn't going to be like Rivian where they show you two vehicles and say, oh, they're basically going to launch at the same time. You know, you're going to, there's only going to be a couple months in between. That's really rare that that happens when a startup, you know, just comes out of the gate with two vehicles basically yeah. at the same time. I mean, that, you know, one of the things that really is setting Rivian apart from, I think, um, you know, many of the other startups was the, that fact. But again, they haven't done anything yet. And that's one of the things that I love about Rawlinson. If you watch the video, you know, he's, you know, and, and, and uh, Guberman kind of says, well, you've got the air done now. And what do you focus on? And he's like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. We haven't done anything yet. Yeah. He said, uh, you know, don't give me credit for something, you know, let us start delivering vehicles yet. It's so refreshing to hear that from a CEO. When we hear so many of the other CEOs from the other companies, if you heard them talk, you would you, you would think, you know, they, they've been a major automaker for 10 years and, and have sold 5 million cars. You know, so it, it was refreshing to hear Rawlinson just kind of tone things down and be like, look, Alex, you know, uh, we're grounded here. We haven't accomplished anything. Another CEO that that I um, uh, that I would put in that camp that doesn't you know, talk a better game than he's delivered is Rivian CEO, you know, RJ Scrange. Yeah. You know, he's also, I've talked to him so many times. He's just mellow and low key, kind of like we're on a good track now. We, we're where we want to be, you know, and, uh, you know, keep, keep an eye out for us. He doesn't promise things. He doesn't talk like, you know, he's, uh, you know, a, a Rolex salesman on the corner trying to, you know, sell you a knockoff. Uh, you kind of get the feeling that, He's legit. And you get that feeling with um, Rawlinson also that, you know, that these guys are, they have a plan, they're executing their plan, they're taking one step at a time, and uh, they're not getting out ahead of themselves, which personally, I appreciate. I don't need the bluster that that we get with some of the, uh, the other CEOs of, of some startups. Right. So, um, uh, right. So moving right along, uh, 
So Ionic uh, is not now not only a car, but it's a new sub brand for uh, Hyundai. So first there was the Hyundai Ionic, a humble but, but very efficient sedan. It came as a hybrid, plug-in hybrid, and all electric. Uh, it's unclear if if it's going away or when it might. But in any case, Hyundai is borrowing its name to represent represent a new all electric sub brand. Uh, the naming con convention calls for the cars to be assigned numbers like Ionic 4, Ionic 5, etc. So there's not going to be like an Ionic Ionic, which is too bad because that'd be funny. But uh, it's, go it's going to stay as the Hyundai Ionic and the Kona will stay as the Hyundai Kona Electric. Um, and even numbers will be given to the sedans and odd numbers will be given to SUVs. The, the first vehicle to arrive uh, will be the production version of the Hyundai 45 concept. And uh, so unfortunately it won't be the Ionic 45. It'll just be the Ionic 5. Uh, the, and you, as you can see in the picture here, the prophecy, that's the sport car to this is this more sporty looking car. Um, that will be the Ionic six and the Ionic seven will be like that large SUV. You can see in the back of the image, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see kind of a, like a largest SUV, and that's supposed to debut in 2024. So that's still a ways out. Uh, so the vehicles under the Ionic banner, uh, they will all be built on the same platform, which is the Electric Global Modular Platform, or EGUMP for short, EGMP. Uh, so in in uh, in light of this little change, we've uh, put a new sub form in our in the inside EVs form so if you're you know you can look up now we have a Hyundai and Kia actually together on the on the forum and the different you know Kia and Hyundai electric models but now you can also go to Ionic and, and there'll be a separate sub form for them now I think they're still going to be sold at Hyundai stores it's not like it's not like Polestar it's not like a separate separate brand it's like just like a sub brand I don't know. Yeah, they've do done think? this before. Look at Genesis. And right. so we had first the Hyundai Genesis, and right. then it became, unfortunately, not the Genesis Genesis, but just the Genesis G90, G80. So they're with Ionic. And I was really hoping, like you had mentioned, we'd have an Ionic Ionic, because I love silly names like this. Uh, right. But unfortunately, no, they obviously caught that one. Um, yeah, it's going to be sold through Hyundai stores. It will likely get its own $7,500 tax credit refresh. It'll be considered a new automaker is my guess oh, yeah, uh, be because it's a totally different brand. It's just sold through Hyundai franchise dealers. Mm, that'll be interesting. I hadn't thought about that part. It's kind of it's kind of like a fuzzy area. You know, there's like how separate does it have to be to do, to do that? Well, Tom's looking confused at me. I'd love to hear yeah. some rebuttal. Huh. Yeah, I, 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 I'm curious to see how that pans out too. I'd be, I, I'm on the other side. I'd be surprised if they are granted their own subset of, uh, of, uh, you know, tax credits for, 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 for this brand because it's, it's clearly, you know, a, a sub brand that Hyundai owns. You know, General Motors doesn't get Cadillac credits and Chevy credits and GMC credits. So that, that'll be really interesting how that plays out um yeah because yeah. uh look at polestar though uh where polestar 50 percent ownership from volvo themselves and the rest is geely group but they get their own set of 7500s so yeah. uh it's depending on how they set it up but i would think since it's an ev brand it would be smart for them i believe it's called a wmi for them to apply for an entirely new automaker thing um and I believe that's what they did with Genesis, honestly, because the Genesis PR people, the Genesis corporate people are different yeah. than the Hyundai people. So like I was requesting to drive a G90 recently, it was just redone. It's like, sorry, I can't talk to Hyundai. I got to go over here to these people, but it's all sold in the same building. So I, I don't know how separate it's going to be. Yeah. I mean, all... Again, I'm, I'm not saying I, I know how it's going to be, but mm. the fact that it was spawned from Hyundai and that some of the, v, like they already sell the Kona and the, and the Ionic. I, I, I'm not saying they can't. I'm sure there'd be a lot of paperwork and it, they might incur a lot more expense just to try to get, the, it might not be worth it to them is what I'm, is, is what I'm getting at. Um, but it would be, it'd be super interesting to see if, if they're able to do that. Uh, I, I, I 
I think the tax credit in, is going to get if if there is in in November in the U.S. If there is a change in leadership, uh, I believe that the electric vehicle tax credit is going to get rewritten. I think it's 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 going to be changed, and uh, this might all be you know moot. This whole this whole point might just be um, you know might go away with each individual automaker getting a certain amount of credits because we're we're at, we're at a point now where two American companies are being hurt by this Tesla and 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 General Motors they're a competitive disadvantage and now you're talking about a South Korean company splitting their company in two so they can get double the tax credits while these two American companies can't and now we're we're seeing Chinese companies import to the US and they'll get the tax credit so it just doesn't make sense for us to continue to have this tax credit this way I'm all for kind of like just pooling the credits, saying, okay, the set, the credits are going to sunset in, say, 2024. It's a free-for-all until then. Sell as many EVs as you can. You get the federal tax credit. But on January 1st, 2025, it's gone. Nobody gets it. And I'd support that and uh, because right. I don't believe we're going to need it past right. 2024. Uh, and then, it, then it, it kind of would reinvigorate GM and Tesla. It would give... It would give the American car. Listen, this is an American tax credit that mm. it's the American taxpayers are 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 are, are subsidizing, um, and you have it now where the two biggest American electric vehicle car makers no longer can benefit from it, and all the foreign companies can. So, and and I'm not against that. I'm not against globalization. I'm not saying oh these companies should be selling their car share. That's fine. Bring your car share. Sell them here. But, but don't put the two largest electric vehicle, domestic electric vehicle makers at a competitive disadvantage to foreign companies. It's, right. it's, it, 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 the, the tax credit needs to be rewritten, period. The, the, the cap is sort of like punishing them for doing a good job of you know, what the thing was uh, you know, meant to do to, in, to begin with is you know, increase EV ownership yeah. and EV take up. And, and they've yeah. done the, the, that and now they're you know being punished for reaching that goal so soon so yeah i'm worried that it's going to take a while because i'm sure if if the government changes in november that the new one will have a lot on its plate and it might take a year before anything happens you know with it with the tax credit situation or, or yeah and i'd kind of like to see it become like more of a rebate than a tax credit but you know, that, well that's what we that's the so that's the system we have and it's not split by manufacturer but split by powertrain so you get more money off a pure electric car than you do a plug-in electric car and you get no money off a mild hybrid so that's the way that we don't split it by manufacturer here and then in uh, and but it's still only three thousand pounds whereas in, it, in in germany it's like nine and a half thousand euros it's it's huge wow that's a lot and that's, so, that's, and that's yeah, that really gets the big incentives. Yeah, that's and that's money off the car. That's mu that's not waiting for next year's tax bill to be filed. That's okay. money off the car. It's like a rebate. Yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, you you have nothing to do with it. So they do all uh, the paperwork. So it just comes the, off the, the price. The, the the consumer has nothing to do with claiming it or anything like that. It's all to do at, d at dealer level. They look after all of that, and they will. Uh, uh, it's not even the dealers that get the money. It, it, I think it's the manufacturers. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the manufacturer. I think the manufacturer should get the money, but which is strange. Well, now we've learned why Taycan's so expensive. <laughs> well, in, <laughs> and in right. Germany, they, in Germany, they make the they make the manufacturer pay a portion of the money to the consumer, which is strange because they're taking off. You know, you get your nine and a half thousand euros off the price of the car, but then half of that is coming from the car makers <laughs> themselves. So they're kind of clawing some of it back. But um, here, it's 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 from the government and it's 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 it's, it's smaller but it, it tapers down according to the kind of powertrain that you want that's to incentivize full electric cars along with things like the green number plates that are arriving uh, this autumn the green number plates man <laughs> the UK... with, un, with, un, with unspecified benefits by the way an ex right. exceptional piece of legislation we all <laughs> we uh, uh, whether it's a new ev or or i can i can apply to have one put on mine and so of course you ask what do I get for that? Well, we haven't decided yet. So, right. <laughs> can I park anywhere? Can I drive in bus lanes? Do I go into low emissions? Ah, we'll work that out, but have a nice number plate so that you feel good. Right. Martin, can you explain the difference between the yellow plates and the white ones that you guys use? Yeah, front and rear. 
So when, oh, okay. <laughs> so when you see pictures of our cars, it's always the white one on the front and the yellow one on the back. And don't ask me why. It's just always been that. Th no, there must be a reason. Surely there must be a reason. But I, that's why. Yeah. Well, there is because every so. other country has one color. Yeah, yeah. And so whereas we like yeah. to have two. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had never noticed that before. That's bizarre. immediately after this podcast, I'll be googling why does Great Britain have two number plate colors? Yeah. <laughs> right. It's one of those things that you never, yeah. like, you've never, I, I never question until someone says why. I don't know. There's someone watching this right now, screaming in their head, trying yeah. to tell us. Yeah, yeah. And it'll be in the. By the time we watch it back, it'll be in the comments below. Right. Right. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. yes. If you yeah. have answers, please leave them in the comments. Thank you. Right. So, uh, moving along. The Cadillac Lyric electric SUV will cost under $60,000, apparently. As the president of General Motors North America, Steve Carlyle, was speaking at a J.P. Morgan auto conference and said of the Lyric, this car, I'm not sure, I, I was going to do it like an impression, but I'm not sure if I, I don't know if I can do Steve, but uh, we'll just do like whatever, an anonymous executive. This car will need to be priced similar to how the industry prices mid-sized Lux SUVs today. Maybe at a slight premium at the outset, it's a price that won't be in the five high, high five digits. It won't start with a seven and it won't start with a six. So by, by our math, that means like under $60,000, but but probably, probably not much less. Uh, is that low enough, Kyle? No, they need this thing to be less than free to get me interested. It is so <laughs> ugly. Who would ever want to look at that car? Goodness gracious. Uh, absolutely not. I think uh, that's the right price uh, for the specs. However, yeah. like we're still years away. It doesn't matter. I just think, you know, we'll see what they come up with in the next three years before this car <laughs> launches. And uh, as Tom said, we, we don't know what the tax credit situation is going to look like in three years. Right now, the car would not qualify for anything, um, you know, which means like you're going to basically be looking at at that point, whatever the refresh, new tech, everything in it, either top spec Model Y, low spec Model X, uh, e-tron or I-Pace or whatever these next generation cars are going to be right. going up against this brand new Cadillac that. I'm not sure who it appeals to because everyone I've asked, some say, yeah, it looks okay. But like, would you buy it over a Tesla? And not one person wow. has said yes. All right. So That's I don't know good, who it's, it's for. Good point. Good point on pricing as well. Good point on pricing because in two two or three years' time, those battery prices will have come down even more. Like, I don't know if, 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 if pricing is going to be a core part of Tesla battery day or whether they're going to go on things like density and things like that. But uh, you know, there's that there's that psychological hundred dollars per kilowatt hour at pack level number, and you know if that's if that does get banded around, if they do say they've hit it, that uh, uh, they can make that. So even then, you're looking at a hundred kilowatt hour battery packs. You're looking at the because that's the size of the pack in the lyric, being well, that's ten grand of the sixty. Hmm. So you've got to like, where's the rest of the money in that car going to make it a sixty thousand dollar car? It better be really yeah. special yeah because no longer is the battery pack because you know not, not so long ago that would have been a hundred thousand dollars for that battery pack but right. now if it's 10 grand by the time that car is out and it could be the end of this year well then, then you got to make that car really special to charge that much money for it and i'm not sure they've got the specs for it yet right well, then... and they don't have the loyal consumer base either that's waiting to buy this car everyone that was loyal to cadillac has gone mm. i mean they've lost everyone the, here for example they had super cruise an amazing uh, driving assistant technology and then they basically killed the only car that used super cruise for so for a period of like a year you could not even buy a Cadillac with their best driver assistance technology. And this is the state of GM. They have no idea what they're doing. They're going around in circles and backwards. Even look at Chevrolet with the Blazer, for example, right? That was a huge opportunity to compete with Bronco and Jeep. And they totally failed and just made another midsize SUV. So it shows they really are not paying attention to the market, to what's hot and what's selling. And I hope that changes by the time this car comes to market. They have two years to turn it around. But I got to tell you, that presentation that we watched is not a good indication that this car will be anything special. Right. I, yeah. I think the the, the the interior looked promising. You know, it has a nice 33-inch uh, LEDs, 
LED screen across the front, but also like the screens in the back and the, the seats are nice and thin, but they look comfortable. You know, it looks like a nice place, but like you were saying that like the tech specs, like the range and the charging speed is not yeah, super Yeah, the compelling. interior hasn't been engineered for real life use yet. It's just right. here's some sketches. Here's kind of a look at what we think it will look like. Right. And then we're going to let the engineers make a seat that's really thick because <laughs> of safety and all this other stuff. Yeah, that's a concept car interior, isn't it? The one that they presented. Yeah. So well, Yeah, and yeah. I gotta tell you, that screen, I don't see any benefit to having a thin, really long screen right. if, at all. Uh, right. I just think that's super distracting. So right. I, I well, wouldn't so, look, want a bigger screen than the Tesla. So much of that tech is gonna be commoditized very, very soon. So if you look at all of the high tech Chinese cars that are really highly connected and that 4G and 5G and great. Uh, voice activation and things like that. But they've all got massive screens. So at no point yeah. can you go in, in three years' time, Cadillac can't be saying, well, we've got a 33-inch screen because that's going to be, if not normal, all of those things are just going to be the given. They're going to be commoditized. They're not going right. to be special anymore just because you can buy a screen from any Chinese screen maker and slap it in your car. The, right. the differentiators are going to be... Uh, it's like mobile phones, isn't it? Like, what's the ecosystem that you want to live in? And you talk about super cruise, and that could be something that actually, at a lower point of entry for the car, you could offer as a subscription service. So if you do a lot of highway miles, or you do a lot of driving where that's going to, maybe you could subscribe to that, but but have a lower price of entry to the car to get more people in them. Or maybe, like you say, it's the brand thing. We don't have that brand here. So it, it, maybe you, you buy into a certain brand. But the things like the tech, the batteries, the motors... The big screen. I mean, everyone's going to have that. Uh, most of the Chinese cars do have that already. Right. It's going to be, what's the experience? Like, what's the software? What Does it connect with my voice assistants that I have at home so I can get inside the car and, and say either to my, I won't say the words because I've got two of them here and they'll fire off. But, if, you know, if I'm saying to my Amazon device or my, my Google device, hey, play my morning drive playlist. Like, if it, how does it fit into my life where I can walk out of my house and the car's unlocked already because I'm walking up to it? All of those things are going to be the differentiators in the future. It won't be on a big screen. I mean, that's cheap as chips anyway. Yeah, well, I think uh, Cadillac has their, their work ahead of them. Look, they've done a big brand uh, image change when they launched the Escalade. They had that Led Zeppelin commercial. It was the hot car. People really got back into Cadillac at the time. Now they're, you know, I've never seen a car company pitch so far away from a younger generation, like my generation out of vehicle, because if you look at all of these midsize SUV, CUV things, they're all towards growing families that are, you know, sort of environmentally conscious, blah, 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 that are like my generation that kind of want tech and cool stuff. But I honestly saw a guy my age driving a Cadillac, I think it was like an SRX, something that's like, or, you know, whatever their new CT small SUV thing is. And I was like, how did you end up in that car? Like that made no sense. It's just no one in my generation, which is the generation that's going to be buying more and more cars, uh, has any sort of brand recognition with Cadillac. And I got to tell you, this lyric doesn't do anything for most people my age to get us excited about Cadillac. So maybe they should just stick to making boring cars for their existing user group and let them die out slowly. But, you know, it's up to them, but I don't think this lyric's going to be anything stuff. They seem Kyle, pretty married his, to this. His, like this, his dad this. was owns the dealership. That's why he was driving the the that new SUV. Right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's a heavy dumpers, The initial point was we were talking about the price here. Um, I know we we beat up Cadillac pretty good last week on the podcast, and we're we're continuing the pile on now, and rightfully so. Uh, but circling back, just to put a button on this, um, as far as price wise. Uh, I, th I think they had to come in, uh, you know, uh, under $60,000. Cadillac learned a lesson with the ELR, you know, back, you know, years ago when uh, they, th they, they brought this car out. That it was basically a, 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 a more polished Volt, uh, much nicer. Obviously, the beautiful cars. I've driven them. Actually, I, I really enjoy driving the ELR. Um, but they brought this thing to market at like 70,000 plus and, and really thought that people were going to buy it. And were like, they found out two months later, they had to discount them like $20,000 right. just to get them off the lots. And it was an enormous loss for, for, for GM. So I think I mean, they realized that they can't just slap a, a, a Cadillac, 
logo on a car anymore and 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 have it be competitive right uh, w- which is super important that they're bringing this in at under 60,000 however again the timing you know under 60,000 if it was if they were launching it in 6 months you know i th- i think I, I think they might have a place in the market it's impossible to to say how this vehicle is going to be where it's going to be where it's going to fit in in two and a half, three years time, you know, uh, prices of batteries keep dropping. Cars are getting more and more competitive. This might be a competitive vehicle now, but you know, in the spring of 2023, I don't know. Uh, you know, it's, I'm kind of with Kyle on this and uh, that, you know, GM what's going on, you know, Cadillac, right. you know, what a shame, you know, how the mighty have fallen uh, and, and electrification might've been a great opportunity for them to kind of get back in the game and be an exciting brand again and, you know, get younger buyers involved, like Kyle was saying. And man, it, it just doesn't seem like that's happening. It's, and it's sad, it's sad to see. Well, the, uh, the inside EVs forum now has a Cadillac section. So uh, maybe I'll start a thread about, you know, how, how can Cadillac get its mojo back? Because, you know, it's really been wandering like rudderless, like through the desert wilderness for 40 years, it seems like. <laughs> You know, uh, are they a performance brand? Are they a luxury brand? Or are they like a Euro Sport? Is, yeah, they've been kind of all over the map this you know past few years, and they've come up with some great products. You know, um, in that you know, appealing to different segments, but nothing's really been a home run. And, and the brand itself is just, it's just kind of treading water basically. And you know, now with this new direction, maybe the, it'll help. You know, um, I think one of the cars we haven't seen or most people haven't seen yet is the uh, Celestique, which is like supposed to be like a two hundred thousand dollar hand built. Uh, it's pretty. I thought it looked pretty great, uh, but you know it's like super long. It's like it's like harkens back to the old Cadillac from the you know sixties and seventies in a way, but you know with modern luxury feel and like like and I I think that I think that could be you know Amer- just to focus on like American luxury. Don't worry too much, but you know it's going to have plenty of performance. Yeah, that's a that's a rough render. If you're looking on the screen, that's a kind of a, if you can see that back tail light, the way it comes up and up the side, the C pillar in the back, it's kind of like the Lyric has. Uh, if you look at the Lyric, then tr- it's uh, it's a little bit thicker on the Lyric, and it'll be a little bit thicker on the Celestique as well. But yeah, it just like don't try to be a Euro luxury. Just be American luxury. Maybe a little soft, a little softer. And you know, have all that straight line performance that you need, but you know, just I don't know. What do you think about that, Kyle? No, next. Sorry, let's move on. I'm done talking about Cadillac. <laughs> Who wants to talk about them anymore? Okay, is there something exciting we can talk about in this show? Uh, <laughs> no, I'm looking down. I, just, I really think uh, that that car looked just as ugly as the Lyric right. to me, honestly. I just think they, they, uh, it, it does nothing for me. I hate to keep knocking on Cadillac, but at the same time, it's kind of fun because I I try to defend all these other startup right. EV companies all the time because I really do think a lot of them are onto something, and I think quite the opposite of should, GM right should now. Should we make Very up for it and, and let him talk about his Polestar uh, review? <laughs> oh, my juicy Polestar. I love it. <laughs> I, mean, I, feel, I feel bad now that we've, up, we've upset him. He, he hates the car so okay. much. We'll, we'll get to the Polestar in just a sec. <laughs> But, uh, okay, but we'll okay, just hit a couple okay. things really quick. And just taking the time, we've got uh, a little less than 15 minutes. But so um, recently, Tesla had sued Rivian for poaching employees, and there were some like IP theft allegations going on. So uh, Rivian has re- retaliated in a way. They've filed some motions, uh, you know, complaining, wanting them to drop, you know. Uh, drop the lawsuit, or at least parts of it, and you know, saying its reputation has been affected. Um, let's see. Te- in its motion, Tesla uh, Rivian said Tesla did not file this case to defend or protect any legitimate intellectual prop- property rights. Tesla sued in an improper and malicious attempt to slow Rivian's momentum and attempt to damage Rivian's brand. Which, you know, there, I think that's a, a good counter argument. And I don't know. Anyone have any thoughts about this? Is this like a a big issue? 
I, I'm, I really like to see the whole thing just kind of blow away, be, go away because it's not, it's not helping anybody. It's not helping Tesla. It's not helping. I, I, I feel mean, like, people. I, I feel like, I feel like I can hear my parents arguing when I'm growing up. Right. Like, it's just, I'm like, no, stop fighting. Like, you know what? Come on, mum and dad. Like, don't waste money on lawyers. Just get on with making great EVs. Right. I mean, clearly both have got a point to make and, and it's, it's going to, but it's just like how many companies spend a lot of time in court and, you know, right. there's there's important things to be done. So, I mean, I can see it's, uh, companies will you know defend their intellectual properties like like this a lot. Yeah. But then again, yeah. Tesla is supposed to have the you know the ethos that you know they're moving so fast that anything you copy it's it's old news anyway. So you know, just go with that and get on with the business of you know making better cars. Mm-hmm. Right. So, and then real quick, the uh, Ford Mustang Mach E range. Uh, figures have rumored to increase after following some uh, EPA testing. So this could be interesting. There was like a rumor. The rumor is uh, someone said that they heard from a dealer friend that Ford told dealers to look for the official range figure figure to be increased coming soon, just like how the power figures end up ended up increasing. Uh, the range figures will be increasing after EPA testing is completed. And so they, they recently boosted the output numbers as well. So could that be related, Tom? Uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't think that uh, Ford just realized that the EPA range rating might be more, and they didn't just realize back when that the power ratings were going to be were going to be higher. Uh, what I, I love everything that Ford has done with the with the Mach-E. I mean, th- this is like, in my opinion, one of the best electric vehicle launches we've seen from any of the the best of any of the existing auto manufacturers they came out with a big splash they had this huge fantastic event brought out all their 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 muscle cars you know had the the president of the company there i mean you know we're we're, we're just beating up cadillac with their lyric i mean that's how you don't introduce a car you know but but ford did how you do so right from the beginning you know that they that they, 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 everything went great, and now the news just keeps getting better. It's going to be more powerful. It's probably going to have more range. You know, it's it, it, we're going to have these OTA software updates. Uh, they they go out and they build a high performance radical edition of the vehicle and show and show you know uh, people doing donuts in the parking lot with smoke where you can't even see the car. Uh, you know, I just love. Everything Ford has done with the Mach-E, and I can't wait for that car to launch. I, re- I, 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 you know, I'm sure that this wasn't a surprise to them. This is planned. You know, they planned to release that it had more power. They planned to release that it had more range. Uh, you know, one step at a time. Just keep, just keep building the excitement and getting people saying, "Well, it's better than we promised. It's better than we promised." Look at this. So, you know. You know, I'm 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 just rooting for them. I hope there's no major glitches like what happened with Volkswagen with the ID three, where it's getting ready to launch, and all of a sudden, uh, we need a few more months to work this or work that. I'm just I'm hoping that shoe doesn't drop because up until now, I love everything I see about the Mustang Mach E. I yeah. can't wait till this vehicle hits the market, and I'm really pulling for Ford on this one. We're looking at the picture of the interior now. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, is that that. That screen in the middle, you know, a while back, I would have like hated to see that screen sticking up over the dash like that. But now, you know, it kind of looks like normal. I don't know. What do you think, Kyle? I I think it looks great. I'm totally with Tom on this. I think Ford as a company uh, just across the board is getting everything right. They don't make any bad products. I mean that just from total third party, no affiliation, right? Every single you walk onto a Ford lot. It's going to drive nice. It's going to feel nice. It's going to be priced very reasonably, and it's going to work. I mean, they really are doing everything so well uh, in the same categories that GM's doing so poorly. So you know, it, it's uh, future Ford's looking bright. Mustang Mach E, like I said, you know, I've got to meet a lot of the team behind the car. They are a hundred percent, very much under promising, and I believe over going to over deliver on almost every single metric. So, uh, and, and this is just another one of those, it's range. We've seen the power, we've seen et cetera, et cetera. They're doing a full race car, drift car, crazy thing that they're taking people around in that we've talked about a few times. That car's crazy. It, it's all great and uh, looks amazing. Plus you can change the interior colors to any color you want. And how cool is that? 
Yeah, I, I like the ambient lighting. I gotta say, that's pretty. I nice. would go for that shade of blue that they've selected. I think that's definitely the best. Um, you know, I could see Tom driving around on purple, but he wouldn't tell anyone <laughs> about that. So, <laughs> right, yellow. That's just when I go out clubbing. You know, when right. I'm driving right. regularly, you know, I'll have it on a more conservative color. You know. Yeah, Tom, that's the great thing. You know, whatever, what, <clears throat> whatever mood you're in, you know, whatever mood you're in, you can change the yeah, color. Well, I could see Tom just putting it on its ADAS, cranking the music, and then changing the color as he's driving to match the music beat. So uh, yes. this will be yeah. the, every time you see us in a Maki, one of us driving on the road, uh, which it's been great to, to meet some of the viewers of the podcast on the strip. I've bumped into them. Uh, you'll just see us in Maki's changing the color all the time. <laughs> right on. Okay. So. Uh, speaking of uh, startups, or I don't even know, but the, so the Fisker Ocean, uh, we'll talk just really quickly. Uh, we heard it's going to be produced by, it might be produced by Magna. They've got some sort of deal arranged. Uh, Fisker said in a statement that it expects to have a definitive agreement in the next few months to have uh, Magna steer start production of the Fisker Ocean at its Graz, uh, Austria plant as early as the fourth quarter of 2022. And that could be on the uh, Volkswagen MEB platform, we're thinking, which we would they need to do something because they're promising under $30,000. So, you know, to do that, they've got to use somebody else's platform that's already been engineered. And and Magna is a decent company. They already make the I-Pace for Jaguar. So they have some- They make the G-Wagon, they make the I-Pace, they make right. the BMW Z4. Four, I believe, and the Supra, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. They do Astons. Uh, mm -hmm. They are huge. I've owned three cars out of that uh, Austria plant, the Graz plant, and they've all been fantastic build quality. Right on. I was under the impression like uh, years back that it wasn't quite as good. They were doing some high-end models, but it was like it wasn't quite as tight. But I, I, I'm under the impression that you know they've got it really together now. Yeah, I, I'm super impressed. You know, they designed, uh, Magnus Tire is a huge company that doesn't just do manufacturing, right. they do engineering as well. Um, they designed Mercedes all-wheel drive system, Formatic, and like it's one of the best all-wheel drive systems out there. So oh, they wow. know what they're doing uh, in terms of helping Fisker build the car, which I think they could extend their services to, yeah. and then also producing it. So that's, that's something that this small company like Fisker needs. It's Tom will know better than me, but you know they've been around trying to build cars for a while now. Car right. must split off as its own Chinese owned thing. So, Tom, what do you take about? I love this, and 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 I actually think we're going to see this model with more startups. Uh, you know, building out a factory is an enormous cash train, um, and uh, especially now with electric vehicles, you've got these companies that are willing to license their technology like Volkswagen with the MEB platform, like Rivian with their platform. I could just see startups starting licensing platforms, contracting out for uh, to, to manufacture the cars. And then I, I could actually see in the future some of the existing OEMs starting to outsource building of their cars more and more because, you know, managing the plants, dealing with the employees, that huge cash drain, I, I, you know, I, I can I can absolutely see a niche for Magna like companies to come out, prove that they can they can build cars and they can do them really well. And, you know, right up from day one, you've got a car rolling off an assembly line that's probably tight, unlike what you might see with some of these startups. Look at Tesla. You know, the, the, the first six, eight months of, of production from every new model. Let's face it, guys. The cars shouldn't be on the road. Many of them, you know, and uh, you know, but that that we've talked about this in the past. That wouldn't happen with a Magna type of a of a company, you know. That these cars are going to be rolling off from day one, and they're going to be pretty damn, uh, you know, near perfect. You know, not right. perfect because there's always some tweaks you have to make with production. But you know, I can definitely see this. Like in China, for instance. New startups, they're not even allowed to build their own cars. Like, the right. government says, you've got to prove to us that, you can, that you're can that you capable, so they have to partner with existing OEMs before they get their own manufacturing license. That's kind of a good idea. You know, you, you know, in the rest of the world, you can start a company anywhere and build a factory and just build terrible cars. I mean, you're going to lose all your money. But it, it, it kind of, it, you know, it kind of makes sense that you should prove that 
You can engineer cars and build cars partnering with somebody else at their platform before we let you make your own cars. Uh, and, I, you know, I honestly think, you know, we haven't seen Martin was talking about this, like the, talking about the golden age of cars. We haven't seen anything like this in 100 years where it seems like every month there's a new startup. And, uh, you know, all of these companies aren't going to be able to build their own factories. They're not going to have a, enough funding to do that. So, you know, I, I think what we're going to see is more and more partnerships like this where they make them at third party manufacturing outlets. And, and Magna has proven that they can do a darn good job and build an excellent car. So I, I love this for Fisker. I, I think it's absolutely the way to go. Right on. Say, so last week, Kyle... Uh, talked about his Polestar 2 experience. And uh, so this week, actually, just the other day, he, you wrote up a, a first driver review for Motor 1 that we have also on, on Inside EVs. So if you haven't read that yet, please check it out. You did a great job on that, Kyle. I was like really impressed. You're, not, you're a video guy. You're not really a... I, never, you know, I don't think you would think of yourself as a writer guy, but man, that was well done. Congrats. And uh, Thanks. Yeah. yeah. So, so if you're Appreciate interested that. in the Polestar 2... Were those uh, those photographs? They supplied the photographs for that. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's not that's no iPhone photography. Right. right yeah. There. There's some nice photography through that article. Yeah. Thing looks good. So yeah, uh, with, you know, with first drives, as we only have a couple hours typically for those who don't know how they work, right. and basically um, because of that, you want to spend as much time with the car. So the manufacturers typically the day before or the day after will take a couple cars. And in that exact scenery that we were driving in, take photographs for all of the media to use. Um, so you'll see these photos everywhere. Right. This looks, it's like a chunky looking, or ch let's say chunky looking sedan, you know? It's like, it wants to be an SUV when it grows up, but it's, you know? <laughs> yeah, you know what? It, it, it visually on the outside is a lot lower than you would think, but when you yeah. sit inside of it, it feels like you're in an SUV. It's uh, quite a high riding, like you said, chunky car. And uh, I love it. I think it's a really cool thing. The only thing that I really wish that Polestar did was just to continue that roof line and square it off in the back um, because I just don't like these coopy SUV things. So I love everything mm. up until the C-pillar. It's more. It's almost more fastback than coupe, isn't it? Yeah, they call it a fastback, but honestly, it's a hatch. And uh, you know, <laughs> we have so many subcategories of cars these right. days. Mm. But yeah, it's it's a it's a hatchback. But I would just get the XC40 recharge, bolt up the chassis of the Polestar two, or hopefully Volvo, op mm. uh, you know, offers like a Polestar optimized uh, mm. version of XC40, like they do with their other cars. Right. And mm. that I think would be the perfect combination. So, but the reason we we brought up Polestar to really besides the to, you know to tell people to check out your article, Kyle, um, you also found some range testing situation or information that you wanted to share with us. Huge news, Polestar, and I don't believe we have an article up yet, but Not someone's got to write it and get it up uh, because uh, Polestar basically just the U.S. team. This is like the the there's like five people, right? They said, all right, let's just go and get all of our competitors. That, that they could get their hands on. So they grabbed a e-tron, iPACE, and a uh, Model 3 Performance. And I asked them why the Performance, but it's basically because it's around the same price as, as the Polestar 2, and that's what they find most people cross-shopping. Because again, the Polestar 2 isn't just a cruiser, it's more of a driver's enthusiast car, so it makes sense to go for the Performance. And they rented out a automotive engineering facility with a big bowl, a loop, started all the cars at 100%, went until they died you know in this same document we'll have an article up at some point on inside evs they go through all of their testing procedures the tire pressures the weather the wind everything it was really really well done i think and um yeah i mean it's impressive right off the bat just to see how little difference in range there is between the pulse star with performance package and without because you're going up in wheel size and up in uh, weight as well just because of the the brakes are heavier and um, I thought that was pretty cool. The rest of it makes sense. Uh, 234 miles for Model 3 performance sounds right on par for a 70 mile per hour range test. So everything seems as normal. But I actually you know, think e-tron did well. Yeah, I think it did, did pretty well, actually. And I, I love the fact that a car manufacturer is putting their car out there 
with a car they know that people are going to crush up against the Model 3 and saying it doesn't go as far. I mean, yeah. isn't that what That's we want? That's attitude. Yeah. Like, we don't live in a world where you can hide away from these things. Like, you know, there's a thing called the internet out there now, and people can do their own research. And when they see a company like this being honest, being transparent, and saying, look, we drove these cars as best we could, everything equalized, and this is how we did against the competition. Better than some, not as well as a Model 3. Then don't you trust that company more when they say, we're doing our best, or maybe you buy that car and there's a problem, and they say, we're trying our best to fix it. Like I'm more inclined to believe them that they're telling the truth in terms of it's a new company, so that so they're not trying to. Yeah, I mean, we talked a lot about Cadillac in this show, so you know they're starting from creating brand values, and you know we're, they're famous for uh, the head of the company is the former designer over at Volvo. So they got that design thing going on. They got the Swedish thing to call on, but what a great thing to position themselves as as the arbiters of of truth almost like in right. in, in the the minds of their their future buyers and just generally being like hey we just want to put this information out there you decide what you do with it that's is you know brands could learn a lot from that it's a it was so they just did like 70 mile an hour range test that's all there's in this yeah yeah and and, and i now. agree with what martin said just the, the only qualifier I'll say is the Polestar did perform well and beat everyone but the Model 3. If, if uh, you know, if the Polestar finished last and they still put this up, then I might be a little more inclined to give them a ton of credit. You know, they, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they did do really <laughs> well, Martin. So let's yeah. not give them too much credit. <laughs> but, okay. But yeah, this I'll, is also I'll give, great. I'll give you that. This is great for e-tron iPace as well because yeah. we've known they've been very close. However, the iPace, you know, in this document, if you scroll down, they give you the VIN number of the car, the exact mileage of the car that they use, uh, and then the spec as well. But the iPace had the big 22-inch wheels, and the e-tron had the little baby wheels. So it's probably hard for them just to spec everything, you know, as right. normal. They probably honestly just went on Turo and grabbed the cars because the Model Three had like 15, 16,000 miles on it. So either it was someone who worked there or they just borrowed it. Uh, but, you know, it's not an exact, uh, you know, car uh, efficiency basis. Basically, not every car was spec in its most efficient option. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, looking over these numbers, because they have, farther down, they have like a the EPA, uh, where is it? I'm sorry, I'm scrolling here. Right, they said basically how close it matched the EPA uh, cycle. Right, right. But, okay. But, but those numbers aren't the seventy mile an hour results because they have like the Etron and this on this one uh, percentage of it's two hundred four miles where it didn't it didn't break two hundred miles on the seventy mile an hour test. Oh, okay, is that on like the official Polestar website or where where can we? Uh, oh, we'll we'll no we'll, we'll... I. It's going to go on inside EVs. I think it was only sent okay. to us, really, or just cool. maybe a handful of people. But yeah. Cool. Okay, cool. Right. I'll look out for that. Sounds interesting. All right. Well, that, uh, that's the show for this week. Um, thank you all for joining us. If you have any comments about any of the topics on today's show, you can comment on the in Inside EVs podcast post or in the YouTube comment section below or on the Inside EVs forum podcast thread. Uh, don't forget, you can find and follow our panelists on Twitter. Tom is at Tomalog. Martin is at EV News Daily. Kyle is at Out of Spec. And I'm Dominic underscore Y. Uh, click subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. And we'll see you all next week. Ciao.